Jump and Whip. This was the foundation of the Castlevania franchise, the two core gameplay elements which defined the series. If one took away the music, graphics, and horror movie themes, it would still be easy to identify a Castlevania game thanks to the underlying mechanics. I wonder what would happen if these two Castlevania pillars were fundamentally changed. Castlevania III Dracula's Curse is the final chapter of the NES trilogy and a return to form. While the second game experimented with a large connected overworld, RPG elements, and a vastly expanded item set, Dracula's Curse is a more traditional Castlevania experience. It would be years before Castlevania would expand upon the ideas presented in the second game. However, Castlevania III still experiments with new features. First is the branching paths. At various points in the adventure, the player is given the choice to take a lower path or upper path, each featuring different stages. These paths all eventually converge, but it does add replayability and variety to the experience. And unlike a 3D Sonic game, one doesn't have to replay the game multiple times to unlock a true final boss, which is nice. More importantly, these different paths feature different side characters. Trevor Belmont controls exactly the same as Simon, as best as I can tell, from jumping to whipping. Even the sub-weapons are the same, lacking any additions. However, while Trevor is old hat, the three new characters are anything but. Upon beating certain bosses, the player will have the chance to let one of the characters join the party. Once joined, the player can switch between Trevor and the ally at any time with the touch of a button. Sypha introduces new magic to the game with a flame spell, homing ball spell, and a freeze spell that I never used on my recorded run. It can also be used to freeze water, which is neat. I guess, but mostly useless. The flame spell is alright, but isn't really better than the whip. The homing orbs are game-breaking though, eliminating the player's need to aim while dishing out some impressive damage. Alucard's gimmick is his ability to turn into a bat and fly, which does use up hearts. This allows the player to fly past certain obstacles and shortcut through some areas. The trade-off is Alucard doesn't have access to the sub-weapons, except the stopwatch. He does have a projectile attack though, which fires in three directions once fully upgraded, but it lacks the damage output of the whip. Lastly, there's Grant. He moves noticeably faster than the other characters. He can change directions in the air, his jump is higher, and and he can climb up walls and ceilings. His primary weapon is also a throwing dagger, in the Japanese release anyway. He even has access to sub-weapons, so one could have a throwing dagger and the axe, which is a powerful combination. Or I guess one could ignore all of the alternate characters if they so choose. As I play Castlevania III Dracula's Curse, I can't help but think about how these characters change the core gameplay, and wonder if the developers considered all the possibilities these new characters brought to the table, from boss interactions to platforming, Castlevania 3 is often a much different experience than its predecessors. Another major change is the verticality. The original Castlevania was a side-scrolling affair through and through. For the most part, the stairs were merely used as a screen transition. Castlevania 2 is a different beast. The towns and mansions scroll in all directions, and stairs are no longer just a screen transition, but a more integral part of the experience. Unfortunately, Simon walks upstairs extremely slow, and there were rarely any obstacles to Tend with, so these segments felt slow and boring, breaking up the pace of the game. In retrospect, I rather appreciate how the first game handles them as screen transitions, rather than the main component of the stages. In Castlevania 3, the vertical elements are vastly improved over Simon's Quest. Trevor moves at the same speed on stairs, but enemies are actually designed around these moments, so level pacing remains intact. Even better, stairs aren't always the focus of the vertical sections anyway. In the first level is a long trek up a tower, and half the time the player is required to jump to make progress, rather than just march up the stairs. It is a good teaching moment too, letting the player see exactly how far and high Trevor can jump, information which will be crucial later on. As the player ventures closer to Dracula's tower, these vertical sections turn into auto-scrolling sections, sometimes upward and sometimes downwards. These moments can be tough, with the player expected to deal with difficult enemy patterns while on stairs and make accurate jumps, all while the screen slowly moves, forcing quick decisions. It is a stark contrast to Castlevania 2, which never seemed to utilize the vertical movements in meaningful or engaging ways. 
Dracula's Curse also marks a return of a superb presentation. The tile work is exceptional. Despite limited cartridge space, memory limitations, and color limitations, the artists managed to craft a vibrant and detailed world. I was struck by the swamp stage, not only by the excellent color usage, but the decaying trees in the background. Even with limited information on the screen, it is clearly communicated to the player exactly what the environment is. The caves are another awesome area. Despite there being just a single background, layer, there is still depth. The far background is blue and details are small. And then there is a closer layer, with a different color palette and the rocks more easily defined. It gives the scene some extra depth and represents a level of artistry not often found on the hardware. And as the game takes place in the 1400s, there is plenty of brick. And again, the artists at Konami managed to take this building material and make it visually interesting. Be it large bricks, small bricks, background bricks, round bricks, the environments feel natural and really Realistic, rather than feeling like a grid of basic tiles. There are plenty of organic elements as well. Water plays a much more prevalent role in Castlevania 3 compared to its predecessors. There are plenty of waterfalls, for example, and they are significantly more interesting than those found in Simon's Quest. This is a simple effect, just alternating colors to simulate movement, but little touches like this go a long way in the overall level of polish presented. The sprite work is also terrific. I love the monsters in the swamp, thanks to clever animation and color shifting, they actually look like they are dripping with mud, or these headless monsters. Despite their small size compared to a boss, it is easy to make out exactly what the creature is. The level of detail is at times truly stunning, and Castlevania 3 contains some of the best pixel art I've seen on the hardware. My only complaint would be the slowdown. At times, Dracula's curse chugs along. While one could say this is proof the game is pushing the hardware to its limits, I would say the game is pushing the hardware past the limits. The result is extremely sluggish gameplay, pulling the player out of the experience. I feel some restraint should have been exercised to keep the gameplay smooth. The excellent presentation continues with the soundtrack. I should preface by noting I am playing the Japanese version. I chose this version primarily because the Famicom cartridge includes the Konami VRC6 memory mapper chip, which includes additional sound hardware, adding three channels of sound to the stock hardware. Unfortunately, the NES does not support audio expansion through the cartridge slot, so the soundtrack was reworked for the Western release. Anyway, my lack of familiarity with the Western release prevents me from making a determination on which soundtrack is superior, but having been an NES fan for my entire life, I was excited to hear something completely different coming from the hardware, and thus I purchased the Famicom cart. And wow, the audio team at Konami did not disappoint. Not only do the three extra sound channels allow for extra complexity not available on stock hardware, but the channels were put to good use with some absolutely stunning compositions. Beginning is an epic tune and an amazing way to kick off the adventure. The opening is loud and intense, much like the game, and then segues into the verse with some rich piano notes hearkening back to the monster movie roots the game was based upon. They build into an epic chorus with an extremely sinister beginning while ending with what can best be described as a guitar solo, something which would sound right at home in a TSO concert. The energy found within this track is contagious, and the piece easily stands shoulder to shoulder with Vampire Killer and Bloody Tears. Clockwork was another standout track for me. First, it sounds like an organ. The instrument choice is excellent, as it fits the time period for which the game takes place, and is also a classic instrument often used in horror movies from which the game takes clear inspiration. Second, the mechanical nature of the clock tower mirrors the technical marvel that is a classic organ. I don't want to take anything away from the composition, though. The crunchy bass blends perfectly with high-pitched notes to create something which sounds both organic and mechanical. The way the notes climb and pitch perfectly matches the vertical nature of the stage, and the track stayed with me long after putting the controller down. Oh. 
Mad Forest is another that struck me with each playthrough. The opening is dark and heavy and sets the perfect mood for a forest which begins with a dilapidated building containing crushing spikes. Again, the piano and organ motifs lend a rich gothic feel which permeates the entire game. The structure continues the trend of a verse building towards an epic chorus packed with energy. The additional sound channels are also utilized perfectly here, with a layer of depth I've not experienced on the hardware. The track manages to sound menacing, haunting, and suspenseful all at the same time, and really sets the tone for Trevor's quest towards Count Dracula. Lastly, there is Anxiety. While I've highlighted three tracks with a lot of fast pacing and high energy, Anxiety is the complete opposite. It is slow and notes linger on for what feels like forever, and the chorus is filled with an overwhelming sadness. Considering this track plays on a haunted ship which appears out of nowhere, one would have to conclude the ship is haunted, and the music captures the feeling perfectly. Castlevania 3 contains many more memorable tracks, and as a whole, nearly every one of them is amazing. Like the first game, the composers match the music to the environments and moods the protagonist is experiencing, giving the game a cinematic quality. On paper, Castlevania 3 is a terrific game, featuring great production values, including excellent graphics and an amazing soundtrack, and added variety from multiple playable characters. However, these elements alone don't make for a great game. Yet again, I must reference the infamous Sonic 06, which features excellent visuals with true 720p running at 60fps and a stunning soundtrack with a whopping 9 playable characters. Yet that game is not good. Needless to say, I find the checklist style of reviewing to be an inadequate way to determine a game's quality. Instead, I find the most important aspect of a game are the interactive bits, the elements other forms of entertainment cannot replicate, the gameplay. First, the opening level in Castlevania 3 is excellent. The first section contains no enemies, allowing one to quickly acclimate with the control scheme, jumping, and stair climbing. It is simple for sure, but I appreciate these brief moments letting a player get up to speed without tutorials or text boxes. I also like the item placement. The first sub-weapon offered is the dagger, which just so happens to be an excellent weapon to use against the bats, offering observant players a safe way to take down these enemies. The stage also features these flippable platforms. Nothing happens when standing on one, but if the player jumps or gets knocked back into one, they flip and Trevor falls through. The first few have a platform underneath as well, so a player isn't killed before figuring them out. The practice is a welcome addition as these obstacles are featured later on in the adventure. Their introduction and the progression later on are excellent and well designed. While not exclusive to the first level, now is probably a good time to point out the double and triple shots. Some viewers pointed out using the sub weapons on enemies and candles 10 times will cause candles or enemies to drop double and later triple shots. This is fairly easy to pull off in stage 1 with an abundance of candles and easy enemies to rack up hits on. Despite the stage not normally containing a triple shot, I was able to reach the boss of the stage with holy water and a triple shot, allowing me to drop 3 holy waters at a time and quickly decimate the boss. There were two other areas where I found this trick invaluable as well. Death is another beast of a boss, but it cannot be cheesed like the first game thanks to a different platform structure. I found grinding candles with the axe throughout the level to ultimately turn the double shot into a triple shot to be the easiest way to dispatch this devilish foe. Lastly is the final boss. The final area before Dracula contains the cross, and thanks to the stairs, one can grind candles for hearts by going up and down them. Using the cross to break the candles will eventually reward the player with the double shot and triple shot which makes the final boss encounters significantly easier. Moving past the first stage, however, and Castlevania 3 is far more inconsistent. The difficulty, pacing, and level length varies wildly from beginning to end. Easy levels follow difficult areas. Sometimes the ideal weapon is available, sometimes it is not. Never in a game have I suicided so often just to start over to obtain the correct weapon or multi-shots, and there's some serious balance issues with the side characters. First, 
Alucard feels underutilized. His weapon is so awful there seems to be no reason to even try to use him. The whip is just better. The flying is interesting and I guess is a counterbalance to the nerfed weapon, but I honestly rarely used him, just to skip a few obvious sections here and there. About the only time I found having him as a side character engaging was in stage 7. In the middle of the level is a mid-boss, something the game occasionally throws at the player, which can suck up a lot of hearts to defeat. The section after this is an obnoxious block falling segment, which can be bypassed with Alucard's bat power. However, one has to make sure they have enough hearts to actually make the trek up. I found it fun to make sure I was stocking up on all the hearts available, to make sure I had enough to get through both of these obstacles. However, outside of this, there was no resource management needed, just switch to Alucard, engage the bat for a few seconds, and then switch back. While I rarely used Alucard, Sypha was more useful, well, her energy orb attack is anyway. It costs just a single heart to use, launches three enemy seeking projectiles, and the orbs do massive damage. Against Medusa here, one orb will do three hits of damage. Against the final form of the final boss, it does two damage. Do the math, and one can see how devastating this is. However, it doesn't feel balanced. The massive damage, ease of use, and efficient heart cost feels game breaking, and in most cases, it absolutely is. Last but not least is Grant. While I rarely used Alucard and occasionally used Sypha, Grant is a character one can use for a majority of the game. His wall and ceiling climbing abilities allow the same types of shortcuts as Alucard, but doesn't require hearts to use. However, his primary weapon is game breaking, especially on bosses. There are so many instances where Grant can just sit on the screen launching daggers and completely cheese a boss. While I can only speculate, I hope the throwing daggers were removed from the Western release as a way to balance out the character. He is seriously overpowered. On the flip side, I did enjoy using him on vertical sections. His taller jump allowed obstacles to be tackled and jumped over in completely different ways. My only complaint is with how his climbing actually works. It is a bit finicky and climbing around corners can be janky. On a few occasions, Grant never made the transition and promptly died. And this leads to another complaint with Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse. The game is at times incredibly cheap. For whatever reason, the designers love to have an enemy appear as soon as the screen loads. This means cheap hits on the player. The platforms don't always match Trevor's fixed jump arc, like against this boss fight against the bats. This gear on stage 2 is a real pain, and the Medusa head always seems to dive down at the perfect angle to knock the player into a bottomless pit. Collision detection often doesn't make any sense. For whatever reason, I could not register a hit on this Frankenstein's monster encounter with the whip. Though I had no issues whatsoever with the axe. On a different path, the encounter includes a platform which places the whip at the perfect height and always registers a hit. Why? These inconsistencies drive me nuts. Checkpoints are another oddity. Generally speaking, in a hard game, checkpoints are placed after a tough section. Once a player finally overcomes an obstacle, they are rewarded, and don't have to repeat it again. However, Castlevania 3 does not always follow this. There are a few roadblocks that will likely trip up new players. On the bottom path, stage 6 has a baffling checkpoint. After dying on the boss, players are reset to this screen. As Trevor responds, with the Leather Whip, which has a short reach, the player is vastly overmatched by this Red Skeleton, who has a long whip. It feels like the checkpoint should have been on the next screen, where a player lacking any upgrades has a fair shot at success. Level 7 is another roadblock. This stage is long. There are these Acid Drip screens and Brick Drop areas, a Sub Boss, the Vertical Flight area, a Collapsing Platform Medusa Head area, a Vertical Scrolling section, and a Final Boss with three different segments. This was absolutely brutal on my first playthrough, and I must have spent hours on this thing, getting a little farther each time just to get hosed by falling blocks, taking damage while going upstairs, being surprised by enemies attacking as soon as one enters the screen, and by what is perhaps the most difficult vertical scrolling stage found in the game. The level is absolutely brutal and would feel more at place as a final stage, but nope, there are still three stages to go. It is bizarre and feels out of place. This jump here 
requires pixel perfect precision, with Trevor halfway off the platform before jumping to land on the seesaw thing. Again, I suspect this was a life suck for many first time players back in the day. Most of the platforming in Castlevania 3 is fine, but stuff like this just feels way out of place. Also feeling out of place are these acid drop sections. The player is tasked with just sitting there, doing nothing, until the blocks disappear revealing the path forward. There's no strategy here, nothing difficult about it, it is just a time waster and a pace breaker. Finally, there are the bosses. These will either be incredibly easy depending on the platforms provided or incredibly frustrating. And of course, if one has Sypha and her electric orbs or Grant, virtually all of them are easy. Some bosses like this hammer wielding guy are decent with Trevor, one has to pay attention to the boss's actions. If he stops and moves his legs, he is about to charge, if not, it is safe to jump and whip. Good stuff. This flying demon thing is also decent. He does three short hops and then a long hop, which is the time to run underneath. If I lost track of the count, I would often die, but it felt fair and the pattern was easy enough to learn. Others aren't engaging at all. The mummies are easy, just whip high for the first one, then kneel and whip low for the second one. Yawn. Alucard before he joins the team is also easy. Throw an axe, whip the projectiles, repeat. The difficulty, fairness, and challenge are all over the map and adds to the inconsistent feeling. Now, I understand my critiques will be a surprise for many. Castlevania 3 is often heralded as the best of the classic trilogy and one of the best games available for the Nintendo Entertainment System. However, I feel like the cheapness and inconsistencies are often glossed over and accepted as 8-bit hard. I reject this notion NES games are somehow exempt from critique. With that said, there are some great moments in Castlevania 3 Dracula's Curse. For one, I do enjoy how useful the sub-weapons are. I found myself using sub-weapons far more frequently in this game than the previous two. The amount of enemy patterns requiring different techniques is awesome, and many moments in Castlevania 3 are engaging and action-packed, the exact kind of twitchy action one looks for when revisiting 8-bit action titles. And I can't stress enough how good some of the vertical auto-scrolling segments are. Timing jumps, keeping one's eye on multiple enemies, figuring out when to attack and when to dodge enemies, all within strict time limits, is a rush. Unlimited continues are again a godsend, and while I hate to beat a dead horse, it is worth repeating some of the most difficult NES games feature unlimited continues, so when games released much later fail to adhere to an established and correct design standard, I find it unacceptable. Like Simon's Quest, Dracula's Curse also features a password save, allowing one to pick up where they left off if they need to take a break. Overall, I can't help but feel like something is lacking from the overall experience. Some checkpoints are forgiving, others are cruel, the difficulty of the stage order is bizarre, some boss encounters are a cakewalk, others maddening. It makes for a poor game pace. For every moment where the classic Castlevania flow is alive and well, where enemy patterns are well timed and skill is needed for progression, there are an equal amount of frustrating moments and others lacking any sort of engagement at all. The defining jump and wit gameplay is strangely absent. Instead, Castlevania 3 is filled with ideas that are never fully realized. The extra abilities offered by the new characters feels tacked on, and the level design rarely takes these abilities into account. Challenges are bypassed, bosses are cheesed, there is no longer a defining gameplay element or a cohesive design theme. Castlevania 3 doesn't feel tight and meticulous, but rather unfocused and inconsistent. Oh! <laughs>